This is an example of a patient who presented at a private practice with an erythematous patch beneath the denture. When examined through the velscope, a second smaller patch became quite evident as well. Because of the unusual appearance under the velscope, the clinician biopsied both areas. The larger, more obvious area in white light was confirmed by biopsy to be mild dysplasia. The smaller, less obvious area under white light, which looks darker with more well-delineated borders under velscope, was found by biopsy to be moderate to severe dysplasia. This is a good example of how the velscope can enhance the examination process of the clinician by focusing attention on areas that might otherwise have been overlooked. This is an example of a large area of leukoplakia on the soft palate that was confirmed by biopsy to be moderate dysplasia. Under velscope, the leukoplakia presents as a dark area in stark contrast to the adjacent healthy tissue on the soft palate. Notice in particular the well-delineated and irregular border of the dark region. This is typical of dysplasia and oral cancer. Even without the fluorescence image, the presentation under white light has all the earmarks of trouble. A white patch, well-delineated borders, etc. Hopefully most clinicians would not ignore this. It is nevertheless instructive to compare the fluorescence presentation with that under white light. This is a good example of how a white keratinized patch, that despite the presence of keratin, which fluoresces, can look dark through the velscope because of the underlying mechanisms of loss of fluorescence from both the decrease of FAD in the epithelium and the breaking of collagen crosslinks in the connective tissue. Notice how these effects reveal the same lesion morphology as in white light, although thrown into a much starker contrast. Here we see another example of a leukoplakic patch, somewhat more subtle and easier to miss than in the previous example, that again is predominantly dark under velscope, despite the surface keratin. Notice the irregular and well-delineated border thrown into higher contrast with fluorescence. It would be hard to ignore this. This area was biopsy confirmed as severe dysplasia. Here we have a large area of leukoplakia on the side of the tongue, but this time the lesion morphology appears different with fluorescence compared to white light. Under velscope, parts of this area show up as brighter due to keratin fluorescence, but the areas indicated on the picture by the arrows are, to varying degrees, darker under velscope. The slightly less dark area on the right-hand side of the image was found to be moderate dysplasia. The smaller, very peculiarly shaped, darker area more toward the top of the tongue, severe dysplasia, and the very dark area posterior to these two areas, invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Here is a worrisome looking area under white light that becomes more so after the unusual irregularly shaped dark area that becomes apparent under velscope. There is little to suggest this particular morphology based on the presentation under white light, and this makes it all the more troubling. Cytology and biopsy showed there to be dysplasia in the area indicated by the arrow. This is a clinical presentation that might present in a typical GP's office, and might on cursory examination be considered an example of denture trauma. Under white light, areas of erythema, redness in the vestibule, and hyperkeratosis on the alveolar ridge are evident. Under fluorescence, the hyperkeratotic area on the alveolar ridge demands our attention with an intense loss of fluorescence. This particular patient was examined in the oral medicine department at the University of Washington. The clinician involved relieved the denture and examined the patient again approximately two weeks later. The areas of erythema and corresponding darkness under fluorescence in the vestibule were gone. The intense loss of fluorescence on the ridge remained and was found to contain severe dysplasia after an excisional biopsy was performed. An interesting case from the days when the velscope was a prototype under evaluation at the BC Cancer Agency. This patient had a prior history of oral cancer and presented to the dysplasia clinic with some discomfort. The specialist who saw the patient assumed it was the area near the small white polyp and was planning to biopsy the area adjacent to it. Before doing this, 
though the patient was observed through the valescope, and the intensely dark area with quite well delineated borders was discovered slightly posterior to the obvious polyp. Because of this discovery, both areas were biopsied. The area near the polyp was found to be mild dysplasia. The newly discovered area was biopsy confirmed to be carcinoma in situ. This is a good example of how the valescope can help shift the focus of even expert clinicians to dangerous areas that might otherwise have been overlooked. This is a classic case study which was published in the journal Head and Neck as an example of a so-called clinically occult lesion, that is, one that is virtually undetectable under conventional examination. The rather unremarkable appearance under white light is contrasted by the intense loss of fluorescence when viewed through the valescope. This lesion was found to be carcinoma in situ upon biopsy. The toluidine blue staining of the lesion is also shown in the bottom left photograph and is somewhat typical of the experience of the researchers and clinicians at the BC Cancer Agency in Vancouver, BC, Canada, who use both tools clinically. The area showing loss of fluorescence is usually larger than the corresponding area that stains toluidine blue positive. Although there is not a global consensus on this, many experts believe that toluidine blue is more specific to higher grades of dysplasia and cancer, whereas fluorescence is quite sensitive to even quite mild types of tissue change, and is thus very good at identifying the full scope of mucosal involvement of a particular lesion. These pictures are from the same patient as in the previous slide and illustrate another useful function of the valescope as a tool to help discover satellite lesions away from a primary cancer. In this case, a non-suspicious area under white light and an equivocal staining result under toluidine blue accompanied a marked loss of fluorescence. This area was found to contain severe dysplasia upon biopsy. A rather remarkable image showing invasive squamous cell carcinoma with a secondary infection. Not surprisingly, the bacteria involved in the infection give off their characteristic orange-red glow from the porphyrin fluorescence. The dark area at the top is a previous biopsy site. An interesting note here is the tendency of bacteria and fungi to collect in areas of non-smooth mucosa in the mouth. In this case, the encrusted and textured surface of the lesion is a natural place for bacteria to become entrapped. This is the same thing that goes on in the normal mouth, where you tend to see porphyrin bacterial fluorescence coming from the filiform papilla, or fissures on the dorsal surface of the tongue, and the palatine tonsil. Also, the fact that this squamous cell carcinoma glows bright red, rather than showing a classic dark loss of fluorescence, should in, should in no sense be regarded as a sign that all is well. Hopefully you've seen enough to understand that this is simply the wrong way of trying to use the Velscope. There can be no doubt that the presentation under Velscope is highly abnormal and warrants immediate biopsy. Here is another case from the Oral Medicine Clinic at the University of Washington. Blinded to the presentation under Velscope, experienced oral medicine specialist judge this to be a case of classic trauma. Upon examination with the Velscope, the hyperkeratotic area of the presumed trauma was found, contrary to expectation, to be dark under the Velscope, with the exception of the most pronounced spot of keratin. Equally important, this loss of fluorescence extended away a considerable distance, both posterior and anterior to the hyperkeratotic area. To the experienced Velscope user, this poses the question, why is that? The fluorescence response under the Velscope is not consistent with expectations of a traumatic lesion. As a result of this type of thought process, this lesion was first sampled using cytology and then biopsied. Abnormal results were found using cytology, even from some cells brushed away from the central lesion. The biopsy result returned dysplasia. This is a case somewhat similar to the previous example, although in this case, the oral medicine folks thought dysplasia without the help of the Velscope. What is interesting about this example, however, is that the Velscope added value to the assessment of the lesion by showing the clinicians that the area of concern was larger than, than what was apparent under white light. Note the extension of the loss of fluorescence anterior to the main lesion.
Here is an example of a somewhat subtle presentation under white light that was nevertheless not missed by the experts in the oral medicine clinic at the University of Washington. This subtle appearance under white light is contrasted with the dramatic star-like morphology of the lesion when viewed under fluorescence. The fluorescence photograph shows that the lesion did not blanch under dioscopic pressure. It's hard to imagine thinking anything other than that this is an abnormal tissue change warranting follow-up. Upon biopsy, dysplasia was found. Yet another example of the scope showing loss of fluorescence that makes an area of suspicion more visible than in white light. The combination of both visualization methods significantly enhances the diagnostic data for decision making. Look at how dark the anterior area of change is on the scope and how vague it is in the clinical view. The dark areas were found to contain moderate dysplasia. Here is a troublesome looking area on the attached ginger that has an intense loss of fluorescence through the velscope. The red-orange hue to the color may be indicative of some bacterial presence there. The area was found to be dysplastic on biopsy. It can be seen in this example that it is the dentin that gives rise to the intense fluorescence from the teeth. Another example of an ominous looking area in gingival tissues. Note the dramatic appearance through the velscope and the large blood vessel that seems to be feeding the abnormality. This lesion was found to be dysplastic upon biopsy. Note also here that the leukoplakic area anterior to the lesion does not seem to show a loss of fluorescence. Here we have a somewhat subtle leukoplakia on the lateral border of the tongue that appears quite striking and dark under fluorescence. This lesion was biopsied and again found to be dysplastic. The lateral border of the tongue in this patient shows evidence of leukoplakia and perhaps erythroplakia as well. The large area of loss of fluorescence on the lateral border of this tongue helps confirm that this is a lesion requiring biopsy. Note that the keratotic patch closest to the molars does not seem to exhibit a loss of fluorescence. This is a particularly interesting case of a patient who, complaining of a f who complained of a funny feeling on the hard palate. As can be seen from the white light clinical photograph, very little can be seen visually, although careful palpation of the area did in fact reveal a small swelling or bump. Viewing the fluorescence response through the velscope shows a pronounced unilateral loss of fluorescence that's hard to miss. As a result of these clinical findings, a surgical biopsy was performed with the results shown on the following slide. The biopsy showed the presence of a type of salivary gland tumor, a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. What's striking here is that this is not an epithelial-based cancer. In fact, the overlying epithelium is essentially normal. One might have thought that a visualization tool such as the Velscope would not be sensitive to this type of tissue change. In fact, this shows the sensitivity of the Velscope not only to the epithelium, but also to connective tissue changes. We saw this as it related to breaking of collagen crosslinks in our discussion of the pathogenesis of dysplasia and squamous cell carcinoma. In this particular case, we hypothesize that the loss of fluorescence arises from changes in the collagen matrix to allow and accommodate the growth of the salivary gland tumor in the connective tissue layer. Here we have a few final points to remember. Recognize normal and abnormal patterns of fluorescence. Your brain is good at pattern recognition. Try to use the underlying principles you've learned here to understand what you see with Velscope and how it relates to what you see under white light. You and your experiences are going to be your own best teacher. And as always, please use your clinical judgment and common sense. LED Dental gratefully acknowledges the contributions to this presentation of the following organizations and individuals the BC Cancer Oral Prevention Program, the University of Washington Department of Oral Medicine, the Benjamin Dental Group, and Dr. Samson 